Well, just a quick word of warning. If Danielle suddenly has an outburst of hallelujah or, or an amen, she might be sneaking a little bit later to listen to the Grace Community Church Christmas concert because it's being streamed starting at 7 o'clock tonight. And that's a, an old favorite family tradition of ours from when we were down at Grace. And, and uh, we're, we're, we're going to miss part of that tonight. So uh, anyway, if that's a... You know, it's like some people, they keep the football game in their ear on the side. You know, she might be pulling up the Christmas concert. So just, just forewarned, she might have an outburst. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Not now. Well, last week we had a more classroom-style interactive time as we looked at the issue of divine sovereignty and the providence of God. Sovereignty of God is His authority and right over all of His creation. It is the doctrine that recognizes God's control over all things so that everything that happens from the smallest detail to the greatest events are all within his dominion so that all of his purposes come to pass. That means that God is sovereign even over evil. We've been looking at that, of course, in the Joseph story, that what man intends for evil in this world, God has his purposes through that. And he uses calamity, disasters, the curses that he placed upon the earth, along with the wicked intentions and actions of men to bring about the good of his people and the glory of his name. That is what sovereignty is all about. And we glory and we revel in the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. I teased at some point earlier today that that's the That'll be the last time we ever talk about sovereignty, right? I did a whole comprehensive study in one sermon or one lesson, and that's, that's it, right? Uh, not by a long shot. The entire Word of God, our lives and eternity, will be spent in glory looking at the sovereignty of God. And we love that doctrine, and we bring it up at every opportunity. Providence is the activity of God that works within His creation to execute His will... And the Heidelberg Catechism said it well. We looked at that before. The almighty and ever-present power of God, by which God upholds as with his hand, even though he doesn't have hands, right, the Spirit of God, but as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, Prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. His providence works through all the details of this world to bring about his purposes. So we did so last week in a more informal style. And I've had some feedback from you that you appreciated that, and I'm looking forward to returning to that uh, eventually, just not tonight. Uh, I'm actually a bit wound up right now. Um, I'm fired up to deliver a message to you that I believe gets to the root of so much of the failure of modern Christianity, of Big Eva, of weak Christians, and of tyrannical government, of so much of what normal Christianity is about. I've listened to things and read some things this week that energized my passion for this subject. I intended to do the sovereignty of God, the Lordship of Christ, before we get into the doctrines of grace. And this one is very important to me. I've shared with many of you that this past summer about the root issues related to understanding both hermeneutics, that is the interpretation of Scripture, as well as the nature and purpose of expository preaching. We've seen some of the struggles that are had in our day, determining how to, uh, uh, how to discern the times, how to be wise and, and apply a biblical worldview in these days. Those are really important uh, to understanding some of the problems with how churches have struggled to face the times that we're in. But the number one issue, in my estimation, the subject that I believe is at the root of every area of Christian understanding and worship is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Perhaps we can have some good conversations after the service, but I'm just going to have to unload 
and preach this evening. And I'll bring back the less formal style in the weeks ahead where we can ask questions and interact. But we can talk even afterwards, but I, I'm going to have to unwind a bit to give you this message tonight. So I maintain that there are a lot of people who talk about lordship, but don't have a clue as to what it means. And I've shared with a few of you my creative modification of the Negro spiritual that says a lot of people talking about heaven ain't going there. Well, I believe a lot of people talk about lordship, don't know what they're talking about. And it can be as frustrating as talking with a Mormon about salvation or about grace, where they use the same vocabulary, right? Have you ever run into that? They value and appreciate the same words. But it turns out we're not talking about the same thing. It turns out we don't understand the same the, the words with the same concepts or the same extent. Our assumptions that we are on the same wavelength are actually misguided. Why? Because it is normal for self-identified conservative evangelicals to accept the idea of Jesus as Lord. That is not a statement of controversy. That is a point of common agreement in principle. It is a subject of mutual appreciation. It is obvious that the scripture communicates that Jesus is Lord. But where the rub comes is in the details. We may think that we are saying the same thing, but it turns out that we have different meanings or different applications. And I go back to my college days as a theology major and my professor, Dr. C.W. Smith, and he said, Theology is the business of defining your terms. Theology is identifying what exactly are we talking about. And what I want to do tonight is talk about what the Lordship of Christ means. It means what it meant in the first century, and it is absolutely relevant for us today in every area of our Christian lives. This, I, I will not be able to be comprehensive it is once like sovereignty and providence. It is a lifelong study. There is so much that the scripture is full of it. I'm only going to scratch the surface tonight. Yet I think that we can make some great headway in understanding and having a theology of the Lordship of Christ. So to start with, let's begin by a basic understanding of the term. The term Lord at its base level means one who has power and authority over others. That's its basic meaning. But in terms of government, the Lord of a nation is the king. He is the sovereign, the ruler, the one who has the power and authority to establish and execute laws. By the way, the United States of America is not supposed to have a king. But I digress. In, other, in terms of other orders of society, the male head of a household was considered Lord as well, because as the head, he sets the order of the home by his authority and rule under God's design. Household slaves have often related to their masters as what? Lord. Wives actually used to call their husbands Lord as well. We see this actually brought out in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Sarah called her husband Lord as a demonstration of her submission to his authority. Peter gives this as a positive example of the roles within marriage. And so Lord is a word that designates a specific position of authority or sovereignty over people. And if wives would like to begin referring to their husbands as Lord, I'm sure there won't be any complaints. Ooh. But the word <laughs> sensitive, no skin. But the word Lord has been understood as a title also for God Himself. It makes sense because the meaning of the word in the Old Testament. It is the common translation of the word Adonai. But you have to be careful in your English translations, other than perhaps the legacy standard Bible, the new uh, translation, because 
these, um, these English translations normally translate Yahweh as Lord. And you'll see that in all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's not Adonai, that's not Lord, that's Yahweh in the English, uh, being translated Lord in the English. And that is where we pick up in the New Testament, the treatment of Jesus as Lord with the Greek word kurios. Kurios is the Greek word for Lord. And in the Gospels, Jesus is often referred to as rabbi or teacher, but the disciples especially mostly refer to him as Lord. They cried out to him as Lord when the wind and the waves were threatening the ship, for instance. You remember that? Lord, do you not care that we perish? But this wasn't just a statement to acknowledge his authority over their little band. It was a statement that recognized his deity. Jesus also took this title to himself. In Matthew 12, verse 8, for instance, when he said, The Son of Man, that's speaking of himself, is Lord, meaning having authority over the Sabbath. Clearly, that is a re reference to his divine lordship. For the Old Testament laws concerning the Sabbath came from who? They came from God. And nobody but God is Lord of the Sabbath. So when he says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, that's a poke in the eye to the Pharisees who denied his true identity. And so it was a kind of big deal to claim such a title. So Jesus, as the second member of the Trinity, has always been God. And so he has eternally been Lord of all creation from the very beginning. He was born in Bethlehem as Lord. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The baby Jesus was born as the Lord, the sovereign, the king, who has the right and the authority over all. And that's a tremendous claim. And that's the thing. I don't think we let the idea of lordship sink in enough to know exactly what was being claimed. That's why, that's why he was such a, a galvanizing figure. And so the magi, Bringing their gifts to bow before the king and to pay him homage, to give to the king what was due, is such a wonderful thought. Isn't that a great thing to recognize? There's something almost wrong about the king being in such a, a lowly estate without being given the honor that is due the king. And so God orchestrates through the Magi the giving of gifts costly value to the king. I want us to look at three passages tonight that bring to light the lordship of Christ who did not stay in a Bethlehem manger. Our celebration of Christmas is the celebration of the beginning of God with us who will grow up to fulfill the greatness of his names. So turn with me to begin with to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. This is a passage that blesses God for the greatness of his salvation that we have received, having been predestined before the foundation of the world. He says we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And now beginning in verse 18, Paul prays for the saints that our hearts would be enlightened. He wants our minds and our wills to be impacted. Now remember that our heart is not the place of feeling. And that, that though Paul is not speaking against our feelings, being engaged with our understanding. But he wants us to think and to make life decisions from our core. From who we are. On the inside as it were. And it's affecting our mind and our decisions. 
Let's read what he says down through verse 23, Ephesians 1, 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. There is so much here we could spend the whole evening just here. But Paul wants us to know the hope of our calling, the riches of our inheritance, and the great power that was shown to believers. And the grounding of all of that knowledge to which we are to be enlightened is the fact that God the Father, having raised Jesus from the dead as proof that his sacrifice as payment for sin was satisfactory, that God the Father placed him in the seat of authority. He sits at the right hand of the Father, where he has the highest position. He is, by virtue of the place God has given him, the place of authority that is above every other authority. All other rule, authority, power, dominion, and name is beneath him. They all answer to him. And let me point out to you that God has already done this. When Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, this heavenly coronation has already taken place. He has been exalted and right now occupies the seat of authority. So let me be clear with my first point of emphasis. Jesus is Lord now, not just the future. He is Lord in the future. There is a coming transition and change in the way in which he will reign. Well, he will be in person, as it were. But make no mistake, Jesus has all authority right now. The position that Jesus has been exalted to is that of supreme lordship. But we must recognize that he holds this position now as much as he will hold it in the future. He is not waiting for anything. He has not been sitting for 2,000 years on the bench waiting to be exalted. Waiting to have the authority over the earth. And when we connect this to the doctrine of his sovereignty, we recognize that just as the Old Testament God was sovereign over all the affairs of men, his providence has always been working throughout the earth to accomplish his purposes that even now, the calamity, the sin, the evil purposes of man are within his purview, they are under his authority, and all of these things, he is working out his perfect plan right now. And some will argue that he is not reigning and ruling now. And I disagree. Verse 22. And God the Father put all things in subjection under his feet. He uses the aorist tense here, which emphasizes the completed action. This has already been done. This act of subjecting everything that is, all rulers, nations, and everything that is a thing, is currently under his lordship because they were put there by God the Father. And there is the activity then of bringing all of these things that are rightly his underneath his feet. 
We are not waiting for him to take the position of authority. He ascended to the position of lordship already. He holds now the position of king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 19, 16 says that it is written on his kingly robe and on his thigh, king of kings and lord of lords. I don't believe that that was a new thing that just happened at the, at the very end of all things. He has that because that it was, that's where he has been exalted to. The reason why he will act in the future as king of kings and lord of lords is because he has been given the authority right now. And since he is exalted as lord now, and we see all throughout the New Testament... That the apostles and the believers, the, the churches, they looked to Jesus as their king. But the whole world is under subjection to him now. That means under his sovereignty, he is accomplishing all of his purposes now. And those who are refusing to submit to him, those who are persecuting his people, those who are storing up for themselves wrath will find from him a fierce judgment in the future. But that does not mean that they are outside of his authority. They do answer to him, and he will mete out his justice. But future judgment and future promises of restoration are not a denial of his authority now. We do look forward to the increase of his government as we sing at this time of year. He is patiently working out his plans through his people. His gospel is going forth. His people are being sanctified. Judgment is being administered. <clears throat> we talk about we talk about Romans 1 and the judgment of God of giving people over. The giving over of people to judgment is God at work executing his authority over the earth and over the kings and the, and the commoners of all the earth. He will be Lord in the future and take what belongs to him and put down what is rebellious toward him because he is Lord now. Because they have refused to submit and bow to him. Before we look into this further, I want to begin to apply this truth. Since Jesus is Lord now, we are those who bow in submission to his authority, which means that Jesus is our king. Is Jesus your king? His laws then are operative. We serve his will. So whenever an earthly ruler or any authority, any other lowercase l-o-r-d, opposes the rule of Christ, whether that's a government leader, a king, or one who proposes to be one, whether that's any other authority, whether that's even a husband, any ruler or authority that opposes the rule of Christ contradicts his order or takes to itself authority that belongs to Christ. We are those who declare that Jesus is Lord and we give to him what is due him. When scripture calls us then to submit to the governing authorities, it is a given. It is understood that our submission to that authority is not because Jesus was given authority, has given his authority to them, that is somehow above his authority. Their authority is beneath his authority. It is below it. Meaning it is inferior to it. It is an authority. We are not scofflaws. We are not rebels. God has designed order, and we've looked through this. We went through the book of 1 Corinthians on this. God has established a particular order and authority and submission relationships, and we love them. It is that we honor and obey earthly authorities as long as we can be in submission to Christ at the same time. 
earthly authority and rule is right now subject to the authority of Christ, whether they acknowledge it or not. The whole New Testament is full of the glory of Christ as Lord of all. And any usurpation of that authority is not to be acknowledged and given any credibility. Christ has no rival. It's not a competition. And it's not even a fair fight. The next passage I want to to take you to is Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I want to look at verses 8 through 10. There's apparently a theme in the writings of the Apostle Paul. And I remember fondly being here with you when we went through the book of Colossians. Colossians 2 verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head of over all rule and authority. Another great passage that declares the Lordship of Christ as being a practical doctrine for us today. Notice what Paul is saying. The thinking and the traditions of men and the worldly principles are not to be given the time and attention of believers. Why? Because they are not according to Christ. And the foundation of our thinking, tradition, and principles for for living, our thinking, traditions, and principles for living, they come from somewhere else. They are not to come from the philosophies of men, the empty deception. Ours comes from the fact that Jesus is the fullness of deity. And what what did we learn earlier? That deity has the title of Lord. God has always been Lord. He has the authority over all other authorities. All other ways of thinking. All principles and traditions. For us, we are yielded to His ways. Once again, that is right now. He is the head who has made us complete in Christ. We have all that we need to live godly lives in this world and all that we need for eternal hope in Him. So what is my point in this? It is that Christ is not just Lord of my salvation, but His reign is comprehensive over all. Now we love the Lordship of Christ in our salvation. It is wonderful. We teach it. We love it. But being saved means he is Lord of all, which includes philosophies, the way we think, our traditions, and our, the principles for viewing the world. That's what Paul says. We are to think and live in every area of life according to Christ. What does his word say? What pleases him. If any part of life is not captive to the obedience of Christ, then it is rebellious to his authority and his rightful claim to all things. We don't get to go outside of scripture and establish philosophies like critical theory that are disobedient to Christ by their contradiction of scripture. Philosophies and theories must be taken under the Lordship of Christ. And we must view everything through the lens of Scripture. Governments don't get to control our lives by establishing traditions and principles that run contrary to God's design and creation and to Christ's Lordship over every man. 
His reign is right now a comprehensive one. Everything is to be subject to Christ or according to Christ. Every true Christian must recognize the lordship of Christ because it is part of our confession. This is what I mean. It's not a controversial thing to talk about lordship or to confess lordship. Romans 10 verse 9 is just the basic Christian understanding that everyone has. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus as what? Lord. Do we really understand what that means? And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. I'm beginning to work through what I'm going to bring on Christmas morning. I heard something this week. I haven't developed it at all yet, but this strikes a chord here. Because so much of what Christianity has tried to do is to make Christianity and faith in Christ easy. The scripture and, 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 and Christ himself has made God accessible. We want to go beyond accessible and we want to make it, him easy. And with this statement in Romans 10, 9, confessing with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that has been turned into something that is easy, that is cheap, that you just say it out loud. But is it meant from the heart? Do you understand what you are saying when you are confessing him as Lord? It means he owns you. He owns everything and has authority over it all. That's a big deal. That's a big statement. Are you prepared to come under that lordship? Are you prepared to yield, are you prepared to yield and bow and submit and obey the Lord? Included in our understanding of the gospel is that Jesus is Lord. And what we have tended to limit our understanding of lordship to is his authority over my life. That can be a hard one for people, but many people can, can admit that. Oh yeah, Jesus is Lord of my life. That salvation includes the personal submission to the rightful claim of Christ to my individual obedience. And that is true. But I propose to you that is too narrow. We need to teach that Christians are to confess Jesus as Lord, period. Not Lord over narrow, narrow, and narrow. That he is Lord. He has, his authority is ultimate. His authority is unlimited. His rule is over all the earth right now. Do you know how great and how big your God and Savior is? His dominion includes the subjection of all rule and authority. Everything is within his right to accept obedience. And the Lordship of Christ is not just over individual hearts. Though that is included, but his Lordship is comprehensive. Even in the context following Romans 10 verse 9, listen to Romans 10 verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Since Christ is Lord of all, everyone who calls on him will receive his grace. And we re need to recognize what we are saying when we sing our hymns. Crown him Lord of all. That's a tremendous statement. Go with me now to our third passage, Philippians chapter 2. And I'm not sure if this is becoming just my unintentional favorite passage, because we seemingly always come back here. It's so wonderful and foundational to the Christian life. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. 
Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here for the Philippians, Paul's message is once again strikingly familiar. The particular emphasis here is on the great reversal. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death on the cross. His humiliation was profound. We've talked about this passage many times that even if Jesus came to earth as Pharaoh or as Caesar, it would have been a humbling of the Son of God. But he came to a significantly lower station than that. He came as a baby to a poor peasant family. He came to be the lowest and most helpless of all creatures of all mankind, a baby. And he fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf. And God was so pleased with his work that upon rising from the dead, he exalted him to his right hand and gave him the name that is above every name. What's the name here? There has been a lot of debate about what that supreme name for Christ is. Some have, have the, put that the name above all names is Jesus. And others have proposed that he was given the name Yahweh. Some have suggested that we don't know what that name is. I believe that the name above all names that he has been given is Lord, as stated in verse 11. In verse 11, he says, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the exalted name of Christ. The name or title that belongs to Christ is the name that designates that his humiliation is over. He is now Lord of all. The Father exalted the Son who took on flesh. He was born as the Lord, but he was not in the position of Lord until his resurrection. And when he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, he gave back to Jesus his rightful place. Though he had added, though he had added humanity to his divinity. Remember before, the Son of God was Lord only in the fullness of his deity. Now he has been exalted as fullness of divinity and humanity in one person after humbling himself to complete the plan of redemption. Notice that his position is not just as Lord of the church. He is Lord of every knee. Do you have a knee? Who's got a knee? Every knee. His authority is universal. Every knee belongs to him and every one of them will bow either voluntarily by the work of the spirit or knees will be made to bow in judgment. He has universal claim of every man on earth. How do we apply this? First for the believer, I love the lesson in Luke 6, 46. I gave away this secret to someone a little bit earlier this morning after a service. You know me, I can hardly, I can hardly keep my messages secret. I practically preach them to you uh, throughout the week as I talk to you. They just kind of come out. But here too, in, it, it, it actually comes from Luke 6, 46. I love what Jesus says. 
Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Ah, that's powerful. Here too, in first century Israel, there was the problem of having an inadequate and superficial view of Jesus' authority. Because it's easy to use the word Lord, isn't it? Lord. Lord, King. Sovereign. Then why don't you do what I say? You recall that Jesus was no basic Lord. And as we looked at the basic understanding of Lordship in the beginning of the message, as in a king, he was not king of a territory. He was not Lord of a household with wife, children, and slaves. There was no natural reason to call him Lord. He was a teacher. He was a rabbi. Came from Nazareth. That's not exactly a place of Respect, but just referring to him in a respectful way for something that was not due him would not have been flattering. That's why Jesus, though, doesn't reject the title because he had taken it already to himself as the title that was due him. However, what he rejected was the idea of using his title and then not giving him what is due that title. If you confess Jesus as Lord... That means your obedience is owed to him above all. Since he is Lord of all, we submit to his rule by living as free men under his authority. We respect, we honor, we submit to governing authorities. But when they come out from under his kingly authority, we give to him what is due him. We do submit and care for other authorities because part of submitting to him is to be subject to the authorities that he has established and called us to submit to. But when any authority takes to, its, him, takes to itself the position of Lord over all, Christians declare that we already have a king. And so we actually need to be discerning to understand the position that Governing authorities and people are seeking to take to themselves out from under the authority of Christ. So when our government seeks to replace God, our answer is, no thank you, we already have a king. And we live free under his rule and reign. For he is gracious and kind. And we call the kings of the world. We call everyone. You better bow before the king. You better submit to the Lord. Because whether you like it or not, you will submit. But come now. Come under his reign. For he is gracious to all who will call upon him. I listened this past week to a podcast and I appreciated the conclusion that they drew. How do we fight against the tyranny of authoritarian government? How do we practically push back against the attempt to own our bodies, to shackle our minds, and to muzzle our speech? Is that not an example? Isn't that not what they're trying to do? Is that not what the world seeks to do? To push against the truth that God has revealed? The answer is simple. And just like the issue of accessibility, it doesn't mean it's easy. But it's not complicated or complex. It is simple. It is that we pay no mind to false lords. It means that we live according to the freedom we have been given by our Lord and we live normal Christian lives in obedience to Christ. That's what we do. 
We aren't radicals and we aren't rebels. But we will be cast as such because normal Christianity will be seen that way. Have you noticed this? That normal Christianity will be cast as unpatriotic, as rebellious, as hateful, as unsubmissive, as ungodly, and all the rest. But the way we push back against the false lords of this day is that we live under the lordship of Christ by going to church without any restrictions. It is to have a big gathering at Christmas as normal. It is to keep your face uncovered like normal. It is to speak the truth in spite of overlords who seek to correct you according to their claim to truth and power. It is to raise your families. It is to have babies. It is to teach your own children. It is to sing. It is to preach. It is to go to work. It is to conduct business. It is to live normal lives and to refuse to bow to the puny gods of this age. Because Jesus is Lord and he has set us free and he has opened our eyes to see his lordship to which we gladly bow right now. And so we must even remind ourselves on a regular basis, don't just call him Lord, but then don't do what he says. That's for us. Don't just call him Lord, but then give to others his position. We must recognize that the Lordship of Christ starts with my submission to him. And it extends from there to all rulers, authorities, dominions, and powers, and ultimately to every knee. He is reigning now to work out all of his good purposes, working through the evil and the good. Working through the calamities and the curses of this world, as, all, as well as all the beauty and the or order that he has created. All of these are under his authority and they will be brought to their knees. And those who humble themselves before the mighty hand of God will ultimately find exaltation from him just like Christ did. We will be exalted so that even in this world, if we, have, if we live our lives under the kingship, the lordship of Jesus Christ, and we receive from this world persecutions and firings and layoffs and physical harm and trouble, the only, the worst thing they can do is kill the body. And that's a promotion. We fear God. We fear the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we live under his lordship. We do what he says. And if that brings the world's trouble. Well, it brought it to our Savior first, didn't it? And we are no better or no more worthy than him. So we accept from God's sovereign and providential hand, both good and bad, knowing that we are in the right relationship with him if we have yielded and bowed the knee to his lordship. And we will have ultimate victory and exaltation with him when he in the future will reign in person, faith to sight, Forever and ever and ever and ever. That's our Lord. Jesus is Lord now, not only in the future. His Lordship is comprehensive, not just my heart. Lordship is universal, not just the church. And His Lordship demands submission and obedience. Lord is not a nice name. It is the name above all names to which all authority belongs and under which every knee will bow. Let's pray. Our Father, we...
praise and thank you for the exaltation that you gave to your Son, our Savior. In demonstrating your satisfaction with his perfect work, his fulfillment of all righteousness, his glorious atonement, and his victorious resurrection, seating him at your right hand. We give you praise and thanks that he is Lord of all. And it helps us to view the world around us through that lens, through that understanding. And it's so clear throughout the scripture that we live with a head. That head has been given to the church. And what a privilege it is to have our Lord, Lord, the Lord of all the universe. As the one who represents us, who leads us, who protects us. Who is the chief shepherd and Lord of the church. So we are privileged to bow before him. I pray that you would help us to bring these things to mind as we are in this season of considering the Savior and his entrance into this world. The taking on of flesh. Lord, I thank you for revealing your word to us. We pray that you would give your church and your shepherds boldness. We pray that we would be a people who love you and who love the world by speaking the truth to it and by living differently, uniquely, right now under the Lordship of Christ. That we might be the salt and the light that we were made to be. Pray that you would give us the joy of knowing you, that you would give us repentant hearts from violating your will and your lordship. We pray that we would resolve to yield to you and to seek more and more each day to apply the wisdom that we find in your word to the ways in which we live out our faith practically. pray that you would cause us to be wise. May our worship be from hearts that know and understand what it means for you to be Lord. We pray that you would bless us, lift us up, cause us to rejoice in Jesus Christ, the Savior who is Lord of all. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.